Um, I want to welcome everybody um, for, uh, for joining today. Um, my name is Andre Lavoy. I'm um, the head of product for the V.02 app, and I also do the um, kind of the hosting of some of our coaches' calls. Um, and today, you know, we have Samantha Jacobson, who um, is a physical therapist uh, at uh, Finish Line Physical Therapy, which um, I always, t you know, I'm also New York based. Finish Line Physical Therapy is uh, New York based, but I'm sure you're doing virtual um, yeah, or, yeah. Uh, meetings as well. So unbounded by location these days. Um, I always refer to Finish Line as like the runner's physical therapy group. I'm sure that's wrong, but uh, I know that uh, I've, I've used it myself as a, when I was injured. Um, but for me, when I walk in there, I just see a bunch of runners getting uh, treated. Um, <laughs> but today we're going to be talking about hydration. And um, this is something I'm really excited about because um, I think I've never really kind of put a lot of thought into hydration. It's been kind of just kind of this like just drink water and, and, and very generic kind of understanding of kind of how it works with us as, as endurance athletes. And, you know, when I'm talking to my athletes, um, you know, when I'm coaching, like I said, I don't really have more technical knowledge about kind of hydrating. So hopefully I can kind of pass on you know, that information I learned today to, to my athletes. Um, and uh, so I, is it okay for individuals to uh, communicate during the presentation or ask questions? Yeah, that's fine. Okay, so we're going to ask everyone to um, just keep yourself on mute. If you do have a question or, you know, there's uh, opportunities to chat, you can just unmute yourself. And then um, try to try to meet yourself when you when when you're done. Um, but with that, um, I want to you know welcome Samantha. Thank you so much for for joining us today. Of Go course, uh, happy to be here. So uh, yeah, just going off of that, um, my background is in nutrition, but I'm a physical therapist at Finish Line, which you are right is it's probably like 85% endurance athletes at this point. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of this, I'm also a VDOT coach, so this is kind of like all three of my worlds colliding um, when talking about hydration. And this all kind of stemmed from the book Quench by Dr. Dana Cohen. So after this, I highly recommend if anyone is interested in, interested in this topic to picking that book up. Um, it's super informative and just awesome. Um, but for me, a lot of these hydration issues were manifesting actually in the physical therapy clinic, um, especially right now, which I'll get into why. Um, but they were manifesting as musculoskeletal injuries. So that's what kind of triggered me to get, take a deeper dive into it. Um, so yeah, so feel free to kind of chime in. Uh, there will be a couple times when I ask you guys uh, just suggestions or recommendations on your end, but only respond with what you're comfortable with, uh, either in the chat or unmuting yourself, whatever. Um, so let's get to it. So first, just we're going to start a little bit pretty basic uh, function of water. So Obviously, water has many different functions throughout the body or else people wouldn't constantly be harping on why it's so important to drink it. Um, and then as a general overview, we're going to say that water has five main functions. So the first one being water as an irrigation system. So water is going to help you deliver all of your consumed vitamins, minerals, um, carbohydrates, oxygen, all that good stuff to your cells in your body. And obviously your cells need water to survive. I feel like if you flash back to all of those science classes when you were younger, they show like that shriveled cell that was completely dehydrated. Um, so that's kind of a, a good image to keep in mind. And water is also delivered and pumped through our fascial system, which this is going to be a really key part of it, kind of how I was mentioning with all the musculoskeletal injuries, but we'll kind of get into that in the second half. Um, secondly, water as a temperature regulator. So when temperature of our body goes up, sweat is produced to help cool us down. Uh, think about how much water and sodium you're producing on some of those like eight mile, uh, 90 degree runs. Um, and then also think about how much sweat is produced even when you're not running. So if you're walking or you're rushing somewhere, if you're nervous about something, kind of getting into all those triggers as a temperature regulator. Waste removal, uh, used for all of the the waste in your body or the production of it. So your sweat, urination, solid waste, all that. Then going into lubrication. So in this sense, lubrication would be that smooth movement between the joints that can help decrease friction. So water in the body helps to absorb shock within our joints and tissues. It protects our organs. It lubricates all of our mucous membranes, being your eyes, your mouth, your nose. Um, within our body, I like to think of water kind of as your grease. 
um, or like that WD-40 of your joints and tissues, which is why it's so important for athletes, especially those maybe with some muscle and joint pain. And then lastly, uh, water as a metabolism aid. So water helps break down the food that we eat, assisting in getting the energy that we need um, and then eliminating what we don't need. So again, flashback to that science or that nutrition class, Anytime the professor put up that big uh, chemical equation or reaction on the board, there was always an H2O in there somewhere. So let's first kind of dive into, before we get into hydration aspect, let's talk about um, hypohydration or dehydration. I'm going to refer to hypohydration kind of as that low grade dehydration. Um, so approximately 65% of the human body is made up of water. That means that if you're not hydrated well, um, any other attempt at staying healthy, whether it's exercising, eating, stress management, can potentially be undercut or less efficient because you don't have enough water in your body to kind of facilitate all of those things. So our job is to help is to maintain that homeostasis by balancing the amount of water in with the amount of water that's lost. Um, in a day, just at a baseline, humans lose about 60 to 100 ounces of water just through breathing, your normal sweat, urine, bowel movements, um, which equates to about like five to 10% of the body's water. Um, and just kind of as another image, that was just that kind of baseline loss of water is equivalent to about upwards of like three week refills of that big hydroflask canteen. Um, and again, that's before we factor in any running, um, any sort of activity, being outside, et cetera. Um, for endurance athletes and as coaches, we have a very special task on our hands to help them determine how much they need to replenish when they're losing so much via sweat on their runs. Um, personally, hypohydration and hydration in general is pretty tough and something I think that many people struggle with since the signs are so subjective. Um, it's not like a musculoskeletal injury where someone comes in with pain and then you treat them for a little bit, then you check their strength, their mobility and kind of their pain scales and then deem whether or not healing has taken place. It's, it's way less objective than that unless you're getting like an official sweat test. Um, so hydration relies on feel for the most part. And although we'll definitely get into how to quantify it in some ways, um, in terms of hypohydration, we're really, there's a couple of signs that we really want to look into. And I, I think, that if you were to get anything out of this presentation, I think it would be to start asking your athletes more questions than other than do you just drink water during your run or anything like that. It's asking them these questions about their symptoms. So these are probably the main ones that I see with my athletes or that athletes might come forth and complain about, but that's gonna be your decreased thirst, your decreased urine output, um, that dark urine color, joint pain, muscle stiffness, and any sort of like chronic musculoskeletal injury. Again, we'll get into why that is in a few slides. Um, some other things that athletes might experience or complain about are constipation, bloating, that poor sleep, headaches, um, dry skin, chapped lips, and then that, those like dry mucous membranes. So again, your eyes, your mouth, your throat. Um, and be prepared because anytime you try to talk to your athlete about hydration, they're going to respond with, but I drink a ton of water. Um, and I know that I am very guilty of also um, responding with this. And it's the probably the most famous rebuttal. Um, but this usually doesn't take into consideration all the environmental factors uh, that have dehydration effects, or it doesn't take into consider into account how the athlete actually is consuming their hydration. Um, so we'll get into, into the latter in a few slides, but for now, let's focus on what's dehydrating us externally. So not even talking about water yet, what else is playing against us? So diet, um, obviously we need to consider this. Is your athlete, can, is, does your athlete's diet consist of a very salt heavy and processed foods? Um, if so, their body's gonna have to work harder to metabolize it. And we know that water is used in metabolism, therefore using more water. Um, in terms of immobility, Mobility is going to affect our hydration levels uh, because mobility and movements are going to allow more delivery of water into our cells and an outflow of waste particles uh, with the metabolism. So although our, active, our athletes are very active, uh, we need to consider what they're doing throughout the day. So I know, again, subjectively, um, I've seen a lot of athletes over the last couple of weeks at work complaining about these little like nagging musculoskeletal injuries that usually were the result of kind of that like stickiness within the muscle. Um, and I attribute to this to what I now call my zero to 100 issue. So 
many of our athletes or just every human in general right now is now work from home. So they're in their apartment or their house all day long. Um, and then 5 p.m. rolls around. They haven't moved all day. It's time for their tempo workout or their long run and they head out the door, maybe do like a quick little stretch beforehand. But everything preceding the run was immobility. Um, you're going to get a lot of that stickiness within all the tissues in your body if you're not moving them throughout the day. And then lastly, so kind of sticking with that whole what's going on in your apartment, we have our environmental factors. So one being heat. So think about all of the little devices that are surrounding you in your apartment, especially right now, you probably have like three monitors, your cell phone, your laptop, your iPad. Um, and then also think about how hot some of these devices get. So I know that like your laptop, if it's plugged in and on maybe not such a firm surface, it's going to generate a ton of heat, but all of your devices are generating some sort of heat, which are all kind of working against you in terms of dehydration. Um, then we have our increased sitting. So again, it's just that flow of, of fluid throughout our body. Um, our air conditioning, which it helps with the heat, but air conditionings also pull all of the humidity out of the room. So that's not going to be beneficial. And then you'll also have all these other little things in your apartment, like your carpets and your your uh, curtains and all those things that are also going to pull more humidity out of the room, which again, I'm not telling you to go into your apartment and rid all of these things and turn your air conditioner off, but just things to kind of take into consideration. Um, especially when your athlete is saying that they drink tons of water, um, cars, planes, and trains, they're all basically little dehydrating capsules. Planes, I think are a little less than 20% humidity, um, compared to like 60%. Um, and that dehydration is just going to accelerate stiffness kind of paired with that lack of mobility when you're kind of restrained to that seat. Um, and then lastly, your lack of sunlight, um, that's going to be tied into your stress and pressure. Um, sunlight helps to kind of downregulate your nervous system and it'll, whenever you kind of increase your stress or your pressure, our bodies are going to go into that overdrive or that flight of flight, which is again, just kind of going to draw more water to help our bodies process all of these things. Um, so quickly before we get into the bulk of the presentation, these are, we're gonna kind of target each one of those environmental factors that I just touched on a bit and just little tips. So if you're little things that you can kind of throw at your athletes to just, to, to just think about, right? Just to kind of bring, to bring awareness to. So with the heat, all of those electronic devices, just turning them on to that blue light mode is actually cooler. Um, turning off your overhead lights, allowing a little bit more sunlight in, uh, take your meetings outside, all things that we probably know, it's just one of those things that maybe you need to um, be told so that maybe you'll do it a little bit more. Uh, your increased amount of sitting, so stand up. I'm sure that at some point everyone has told them during this quarantine to stand up and walk around your apartment a little bit more than maybe you are. Maybe you just stand up and down your chair five times every hour. Or you just move your neck around, you adjust your posture. Anything like that is gonna help. Um, Air conditioning, again, not telling you to turn your air conditioning off, but maybe focus more on rehumidifying the space, um, diffusers, plants, stuff like that. Your cars, planes, and trains, um, bring something to drink with you. And if you can stand up, stand up. And then the last one will be that stress and pressure, which obviously a little bit harder to control, but this is where we create more of a buffer. So if you are hydrating yourself more as a baseline, then when you do have to go into overdrive with these stress and like stressful situations, then you'll kind of have more to take. Um, so that is mostly the dehydration aspect of it. So now going into kind of more of the hydration, I want to know what are some things that either you guys use or that you ask you that you that your athletes use or that you recommend um, just to kind of increase hydration. So whatever product or whatever it may be, just kind of if you chat them, if you say them, whatever you want. Anyone at all. <laughs> the um, pasta, does that have hydration? Uh, pasta? Yeah. Okay, okay. I'll take it. You can, yep, scratch. Okay. Noon, good. Good. Fruit, good. Um, add salt to your dinner. Awesome. Um, so usually when I ask this question, we've, we've got pasta in here, we've got fruit, um, We've got salt. Usually the answer is always water. You can noon, uh, propel all of those things. But so now onto the next slide. Um, so everything, 
you guys were pretty good, but usually everything that's listed is a beverage or a liquid. Um, so here I've just kind of listed the top 10 vegetables and fruits by their water content. So as you can see, your cucumber is having 96.7% water. They're mostly all water, similarly to watermelon. Um, so kind of shifting that misconception of that hydration is mostly in the form of fluid or water. So this segues me into water absor absorption and possibly a new way of thinking about it. So this concept here is basically what quench is all about. Um, so speaking general guidelines, everybody knows the general one of drinking half your body weight in ounces, which it is a pretty safe guideline, uh, but it definitely isn't the most ideal. So I'll explain that a little bit more. If you have a 120 pound female athlete, um, she, that would be, her recommendation then would be 60 ounces of water, right? You cut 120 and a half. Uh, so that recommendation doesn't take any of the contributing factors into her account. 120 pounds doesn't tell us anything about her living and working conditions. It doesn't tell us anything about her muscle mass, which muscle is one of the biggest holders of hydration. So that's going to be important. Um, it doesn't tell us anything about her activity levels, her overall fitness, or if she has any dehydration symptoms. So she could be really good at drinking those 60 ounces or those three hydro flasks a day, but she still is experiencing a lot of muscle cramping. She's experiencing a lot of like late run fatigue, et cetera. Um, so then rather setting, settling on a specific number, it may be more beneficial to ask your athlete if they're experiencing any of those symptoms um, and asking them more about how their muscles feel, how they're, if there's muscle stiffness, if there's headaches, if there's joint pain, um, stuff like that. So another kind of, rather than just focusing on water, um, a big part of this is that we're gonna start talking about gel water. So this is kind of early 2000s kind of shift in science, but um, it started, so gel water, also known as your structured or your ordered water um, or easy water. Again, it's the premise of quench. Um, and a couple things about it, not to get too sciencey here, but it is considered like the fourth phase of water. It's denser than your regular liquid water. It has a negative charge and it also is absorbed at a slower rate, which is gonna help with longer lasting hydration. Um, it's abundant in fruits and vegetables. So all of those fruits and vegetables I listed before also have a very high content of that gel water. Um, another way to explain this, just visualize, like if you look at that cucumber, all of those, that liquid kind of surrounding the cells, that's gel water you could see. Also, if you're someone who soaks chia seeds, that kind of gelish water again that's formed is your gel water. Um, so that's kind of, I'm gonna kind of go back on that a couple times in the next few slides. But now getting to like the meat and potatoes, especially for runners. So again, for me as a coach and physical therapist, this is what resonates the most with me. And I think this is how a lot of those dehydration, hypohydration um, effects manifest in runners. So if we didn't know this before, we now know that the human body is made up of water, essentially. Um, our connective tissue, which is responsible for all of our efficient movement, is also embedded with a ton of nerves and it's full of water. So any sort of pain or dysfunctional movement is correlated with decreased motion. I'm sure all of you have experienced some sort of injury at that point, um, knowing that once you kind of can't move something as well, then that dysfunction follows it. Um, and then when that tissue gets dehydrated or sticky, that's also when the pain or, or compensations occur. So targeting our fascia specifically, um, your fascia, I'm going to show a video of this in just a second, but your fascia is a system of, uh, or a network of tubules that are constantly responding to movement and pressure changes. So it's made up of mostly gel water and collagen, which allows kind of that spreading and releasing and rejoining of all the different microfascial tubules. Um, so if you kind of think of fascia as like the scaffolding underneath our skin, I think that's a good way to think about it. Also, if you think about, if you were to like peel an orange, kind of think about like all that white lining around it, think about that as your fascia. So um, not to get, too much into it but similar to that any sort of like if any of you have ever been in a cadaver lab or something like that ever, the muscles aren't just like it's not like here's one muscle belly here's another one here's another one all of it is kind of wrapped up in this very thick um network which again your fascia um so it's one of the most complex parts of the body and it requires hygiene to do its job properly and um, efficiently. So it's very responsive to movements or lack of movement altogether. 
And then when you do have that lack of movement or that lack of hydration, it tends to get matted down or toughened and it loses its ability to kind of move freely and becomes much less um, flexible and pliable. So that loss of elasticity is, can be directly correlated to some of those musculoskeletal injuries. Um, and ways that you can help this are movement, but also any sort of your like hands on massage or your soft tissue work, um, your foam roller, your Theragun, things like that are gonna create some sort of systemic hydration. So one kind of like thing with this is you're never breaking up the fascia, you're trying to thinking about it as like you're rehydrating it. So you're getting things to move more, a little bit better um, rather than really like breaking up the knots or so they say. Um, so let me play this video just because I think the visual of this is, Brain. is big. Spreading and splitting. Observe how it So you can see how you know, it can actually rejoin later on. And that if the whatever you were envisioning what we think of as the myofascial this. release. This amazing lattice here in So like here, that looks like whatever you were envisioning gel water to look like, I'm sure it looked something like this, right? So you can see it literally looks like our fascial system is made up of water, which it is. Um, so now let's move into sweat. So um, the composition of sweat varies for each person, um, which is why it's so hard to prescribe or recommend certain combinations um, of water and salt to runners, which I'm sure this is, this is most of, or this is something big that many of us struggle with. Um, so in general, Sweat is composed of about 99% water and 1% electrolytes. Um, I'm sure most of you know this. Electrolytes are the minerals within your body that help balance the amount of fluid and water in your blood plasma in your body. Um, they also regulate your muscle and your nerve function, which is huge. So especially on hot days, our runners can lose close to about like 3,000 milligrams of salt in one hour, which is a ton. That kind of, that exceeds someone's like daily intake of salt if it's not someone who's eating a highly, highly processed diet. Um, and the thing with this is this is something you don't know how much you're actually losing on again, uh, unless again, you're getting that official sweat test. So, um, things we can monitor the amount of sweat in terms of body weight, um, the salt in our clothing after our runs and our symptoms are kind of our clues into that. So most of the time, if you ask your runner, um, they'll usually be able to give you an answer as to whether they're a heavy sweater. They'll usually say yes or no. Or then you can also follow that up with, are you a salty sweater? Um, and if they don't know the answer to the latter, then you can kind of cue them by asking questions about if they finish a run and they're covered in that white residue on their hat, or if their shirt is covered in um, those white marks. And you can also inquire about their post-run craving. So if you have a runner who maybe doesn't know so much about like if they're covered in the white residue or if they're really salty sweater, but they're like, I get home and like the number one thing, the only thing I could stomach after a run is like a bag of potato chips or something like that. That's their body telling them that they lost a ton of salt and their body is trying to replenish it by that craving. Um, and then on your longer runs, your salt deficiencies can also manifest by hitting that premature fatigue or that muscle cramping, um, which again, I'm sure many of your athletes complain about. So if that is the case, then maybe it's more of the salt that you start to focus on and kind of play with that trial and error. Um, but focusing on the actual sweat portion, there are obviously many, many things that trigger and affect the sweat. Um, again, making it harder to make these general claims for athletes because it's going to depend a lot on um, the exercise, how long the exercise is, what the weather is. If, the, if it's a female, if she's going through menopause. If it's stress related, if it's a they might have some performance jitters, which is going to affect it, body weight, age, et cetera. The list just goes on and on. Um, but for just kind of like purposes here, let's say that your athlete is most likely sweating around 100 ounces of sweat per hour. Um, and that's 100 ounces that at one, some point needs to be replenished. So how do we track this? Um, an easy way to kind of get some information out of your athletes is to monitor their sweat and fluid loss by asking them to weigh themselves. So I don't know if any of you guys use this practice, um, but these are just a general kind of couple of rules of thumb. So if you have a 150 pound athlete and they don't lose or gain more than like 1.5 pounds after their workout, you can say that they're, you could deem them as like well hydrated. Um, but again, if they're having symptoms, then, then maybe they're not as hydrated as their body weight is kind of leading you on to believe. Um, and then on the flip side, 
if you have the same 150 pound athlete and they lose seven point or more than seven and a half pounds following a workout, then they're losing an immense amount of sweat and definitely need to start rethinking their um, hydration system. So speaking of like what kind of recommendations we can give. Um, okay. So this comes for specifically from the book. So I can't take credit for any of this part, but these are basically just like soft recommendations. Um, again, they're going to require, require trial and error on the, um, the runner's front and on your front. And I'm sure you guys all tell your athletes this all the time, but like nothing new on race day. So anything you're going to experiment here needs to be experimented on those long runs, on those tempo workouts, et cetera. Um, but Dr. Cohen recommends that using the tip of drinking four to eight ounces of water after every 15 minutes of activity. So, um, that's just like a couple of sips. You don't need to completely like drink your whole water bottle every 15 minutes, but just kind of like wetting your mouth, wetting your mucous membranes, allowing some water to get into your body. And then if we're start talking about more marathon training or that very rigorous, um, activity, then she recommends the 20 ounces of water about two and a half hours before the exercise. Um, that's to kind of prevent that like sloshiness that can occur if it's a little bit too soon. And then another 12 ounces about 15 minutes before. Um, and then in terms of sports drinks, a lot of people ask questions about whether or not like after a run, if they should be consuming a sports drink and whatnot. Um, again, according to Dr. Cohen for like a shorter or less intense bout of exercise, you might most likely don't need to be drinking, uh, or consuming a sports drink afterwards. Um, especially if you are consuming a diet that's filled with fresh foods and you aren't avoiding sodium throughout the day. Um, but if you are exercising for more than an hour, then it's recommended to eat or drink something that does provide those glucose and, or that glucose and those electrolytes. So this one, um, is one that came from her book and I've actually tried this a couple times and I actually have enjoyed it. Um, but you've got that coconut water, which coconut water, because it has a lot of that gel water content, um, salt for electrolytes. Then you have the lemon and lime also adding into that structured water component. Um, and then that teaspoon of honey or maple syrup, just for a little bit more of that glucose. And then kind of already wrapping up, these are kind of your three principles of overall hydration. So these are just your takeaways. So for the first one, drink for maximum absorption. So we want to think about getting our water to a cellular level. And we now know that um, it's going to be paired with water, gel water, movement, etc. cetera. Um, so a few recommendations from Dr. Cohen to kind of like kickstart this throughout your day is to wake up and have eight to 16 ounces of water um, with a pinch of some salt and lemon in the morning. Kind of proceed this before your morning cup of coffee. Just think about, she calls it like a pre gut or a, a pre soak or pre gut soak. I think she calls it. Um, think about just kind of like hydrating everything before you start introducing more of your dehydrating components, um, like your coffee and then drink more water before your meals. And then most importantly move. So again, one of the biggest issues is that kind of zero to a hundred lifestyle right now. So if you sit at your desk all day long and then you head out right in the afternoon. Um, make sure that that time frame in between has been filled with some movement and some hydration and gel water and all the above everything we've kind of talked about today. Um, number two being eat your water. So don't just think about kind of reprogram your brain to think that hydration doesn't just mean water. Um, you could start to make green smoothies and green juices to kind of bring all of that uh, structured gel water into your diet. Um, another good recommendation for this is chia seeds. So kind of add them to anything, especially if they're soaked. But um, again, something that'll just help you kind of achieve more of that prolonged hydration. And then lastly, um, will be that hydration distribution, which is all about that movement. So think about that fascia, think about what it looks like underneath the skin, think about how it looks like that gel water kind of splitting and then releasing, and how you need that glide and that slide of the muscles to be able to allow things to move properly um, so that things don't get sticky and then things don't get compromised um, down in the long run. So any of those small movements count. A uh, little kind of fun tidbit on this is that there was a study that came out that said that people who fidget more actually had improved um, circulation in that limb. So literally someone just kind of shaking their leg, which just goes to prove that literally any sort of movement will help. It's just better than kind of that, like those hours of stagnation. And that is it. So if you have any questions, feel free to unmute yourselves.
I had a I had a question about uh, the coconut water. Yes, hi. Um, that's that's high, hi. That's high in uh, potassium, right? Is that why um, in the DIY, DIY version of that you've added salt there? Yes, exactly. Um, but they're also wait. Are you asking why there's coconut water and and salt? Yeah, because I've actually had runners who only drank coconut water, and that proved to be a very difficult problem for them in uh, like marathons. Yeah, yeah, I would say the potassium would help some more with the cramping, but yeah, the salt definitely just to get more of the actual salt or sodium into the equation. But you can also, if it if it's a runner where again trial and error, if they're not responding too well to the coconut water, then that's when you can kind of dilute it a little bit, say, okay, maybe half of the coconut or half, coconut water, half of the water. Um, you also, um, runners will also typically be able to tell you what their stomach can handle and what they cannot handle. So that's another thing um, to kind of, again, it's gonna be a lot of subjective talk between you and your athlete, which is a little bit unfortunate, but. Yeah, I'm just, you know, I'm, I guess I'm talking in terms of, um, you know, the sodium potassium pump, not to get into too deep into the science here. Um, but that's always the, um, the sort of balance that I struggle with um, coaching yeah. marathon athletes, especially if they train in hot weather and the marathon is cool or vice versa. You don't really know how to adjust those um, potassium and, and sodium levels. You're guessing unless you do some kind of um, sweat test, which I don't have access to that sort of thing. Um, certainly do the uh, the body weight test um, but you know it's it's guesswork like uh, you know have an extra banana you know if you need a little bit more potassium um, you know dial back on your salt under you know different conditions so I just that's the uh, that's always the um, struggle I have on when it comes to race day like balancing the, the potassium versus uh, sodium Absolutely. And you brought up a good point. And to be honest, I don't necessarily, if anyone has any other recommendations for this, I don't, I can't say I've dealt with this a lot of like, if someone's training in very, very hot weather, and then if their race is completely opposite, their anything that you figured out before that day is going to be a little bit different in terms of how much they're sweating, which is a whole nother tricky component to it. Anybody else? I think, I think we, was it John? Did you have a question? Uh, yeah, just, uh, I think you just have to unmute yourself. Yeah, my question is actually a follow up to the do yourself one. So that, so we're literally putting all those things and mixing them together, Samantha? Oh, yes. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what it was. Um, I haven't tried that before, but it looks, it, I took a screenshot of that. So like, I'm gonna try it. It looks Yeah, it's it looks good. good. It's good. Um, and I have to say, I do actually have a pretty sense of stomach when I'm running and my stomach can tolerate it. That doesn't say it will for everybody, but. Um, okay. And I here's on the, on the coconut water. Um, I drink it a lot. A lot of the runners I coach do too. No, we haven't, but we haven't tried it in, the, in we just more drink it like outside of the. Right, or, or after. The, yeah. Or so before. after, yeah. So. Yeah, this is interesting. Does it, do you have any thoughts on doing it during, apparently during workouts or races? I mean, I heard the one gentleman say it didn't sit with his, his athletes as well in the races. It sits well. with, I, to be honest, I do dilute it a little bit, but it sits with, it sits in my stomach fine. Um, but again, I really won't use that. Personally, I found that it's, it's more so my go-to if it's really hot and I'm doing something over two hours. Um, yeah. But that's kind of, that's kind of how I've used it at least. Okay. Yeah, thank you. Mm -hmm. Hi, Samantha. Hi. I'm just curious a little bit. So, like, there is also the ability, like, to take um, gels that have electrolytes in them. So, I think Huma makes an electrolyte gel, yeah. um, salt tabs. I'm just kind of curious, like, at what point in time might you recommend a runner start utilizing something like that over um, a drink that might have it mixed in, or um, even if, like, it's really that impactful? Like, can your stomach really absorb it when you're running? I'm just kind of curious what that looks like. Yeah, I, just in terms of like when you should do either one. Yeah, I would say in terms of, 
again, kind of speaking subjectively off of what athletes have said to me, when you kind of get into more of like official races, which obviously aren't happening right now, gels at the end of the day are just so much easier to carry with you or salt pills. Um, so I think a lot of it ends up coming down to more of like the functionality of it. Um, I think that especially with that DIY sports drink, it's nice because it kind of, it brings like that gel water into the equation and it brings, it has the potassium, it has the sodium, it has a little bit of the glucose. Um, and it also allows you to kind of sip it a little bit more slowly rather than, well, I guess you could, you can control how quickly you take the goose. Um, but I would say, I don't know. I don't know much about, I do like the Huma electrolyte, but I don't know essentially like how fast, I know they're all pretty like quick absorbing um, products, but I don't know how fast they actually would be absorbed in comparison to the hydration drink. Um, but I think a lot of it is going to come down to what the athlete finds the most like functional during the race, which is obviously a big part of everything. Thank you. Um, I'm a few of you have mentioned the sweat test and um, I actually just did a manual sweat twist, sweat test at home. Um, I weighed myself uh, right before I went out for a run and then I made sure I went out for a run on a day that was pretty warm and then I uh, measured how much water I drank. I just went out and ran for about an hour and then when I came back I weighed myself again. And, and, and then I, if I lost any, um, or, gain, or gained, if I gained any weight or loss, I took into account the, the water I took. Um, but there's a, a new app out called the um, My Sweat Rate app. Now it's only available right now for Apple phones or it's Apple version, but um, I do have um, an Apple phone and it's called My Sweat Rate, and it'll actually go through and walk you through how to do a sweat test. And then based on the results of that, you can put in a, a planned um, hydration plan for a certain run. So if you were gonna go out and run for three hours and do a marathon or four hours, it takes into consideration the temperature of the day and also the results of that sweat test, okay? And then it'll estimate how much sodium you need. So, and there are some online calculators for sweat rate tests that you can do from home if you don't have um, an Apple phone for this app. So it's useful to have an idea of what your sodium, how much you need in sodium and fluids and so forth. Also, we'll give you an estimate of how much carbs you might need. So just a, just a suggestion. Very cool, thank you. Samantha? Uh, this is Karen. I had a question about the green smoothie. Um, mm -hmm. I have one every day. I've heard something about that before. Um, exactly what is it and why do you recommend one a day? So it's more so it's about kind of getting more of like those vegetables and fruits into your diet. Um, so it's the premise behind that is mostly that gel water and just kind of expediting or increasing any sort of hydration that you can with if you add cucumbers to it, if you add kale, kind of all those leafy greens into it. Um, so it's more for just increasing hydration through that structured water or that gel water. There's a couple different recipes to it. Um, if I'm sure that you can, I have the book, so that's kind of where I get most of them from, but I'm sure that they're also online in terms of, um, I don't know if she has a recipe book, but I'm sure that if you looked up different like green smoothie recipes and if you put a key water gel water in there, I'm sure that a bunch of different ones would come up there. But again, it's more so for that structured water um, hydration. Thank you. So I guess just eating salads wouldn't do the trick of what we're trying to get with the uh, smoothie. You're still um, consuming it. I think you're just able to, especially with, I mean, it's hard to say you'll definitely get more in with the smoothie, especially if you're, if you're doing both. Um, but salads are definitely like you're still consuming or eating water in terms of getting a salad. Okay. Thank you. Um, I was late early on. Oh, no, no, please. Can, you, can you connect or touch base on uh, like a lot of our, my athletes use the Morton. Yeah. Um, this is kind of like the, the, you mentioned the gel water kind of stuff. 
our people love it. I like it personally as well. Did you mention that or what are your thoughts? I really like the, I really like the Morton. Um, I think it tastes a little bit like flubber. Um, but that aside, I like it. Um, and again, in terms of like subjectively with my athletes, they find that those who have a little bit more of that sensitive stomach also Morton is very like slow releasing and it kind of like forms that gel in your stomach, right? Like that's their kind of claim behind the science. Um, which is going to prolong all of those nutrients or that hydration for a little bit longer. But I, and also I think for people who respond a little bit, their stomach responds a little bit too strongly to the goose that the Morton is actually a really good option for it. Um, especially like the, have you tried the pre run drink? Yeah. The three, I used that in three twenty. Yeah. 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 That's what I've used. Yeah. I use that for like the, the hour leading up to the race. I'll actually drink the full, I, I think it's only 16 ounces though. Yeah, and it create yeah, because it's like a very exact water to powder ratio. They're like very serious. They're very serious in that. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I do really like that. I don't know if any of you guys, anyone else has uh, experience with that, but I find that it works great, to be honest. Okay. Well, good. Um, this is just insider information. We're, we're currently working with Martin on a, on a VDOT Challenge team, VDOT Challenge for the fall. So get your athletes to run fast and maybe they can win some free, some free products. Uh, it's not that. finalized, but uh, yeah, we'll we'll be probably putting out more information that soon. Very cool. Um, I had a question. So you know, there's uh, in marathons. You know, quite often, most of the marathons I have um, run kind of have a similar kind of hydration option. They you know they'll have a fuel stations, and they have water, and then this other product. I forget, oh yeah, Gatorade. Um, you know, a very popular sports drink that's available for you to um, use. I, I, I suspect most of my runners, you know, they're not, they're not on their long runs kind of using the same exact hydration tactic, you know, that they kind of have easily access to on their marathons. Is there any risk to like, say them kind of using water, um, you know, on their long runs and then, you know, for the marathons, because they have that kind of easy option to kind of use Gatorade and water. Uh, do you have any recommendations or um, on, I mean, just, should they just stick to water if they're not trying it out? I'm like a big proponent of nothing new on race day. Okay. Um, I feel like when you get to that point of the race, like I've had athletes who have been like, I, I, all I did was have Gatorade at mile 16 and like their mm. whole stomach turns. Right. Um, so I don't play around with any of that. I say that like, if you want, if on race day, you want to be having a sip of that Gatorade, then try to incorporate it in your long run at some point just to see okay. how you respond to it. Um, if not, I would keep with like what's most accessible to you. So like keep, allow the race to provide you with the water, but you bring your goose, you bring any other sports drink you want and you bring your salt uh, tablets if you're also going to be consuming those. Okay. But I don't know. I'd be curious to see what other coaches kind of opinion on that is. But again, I'm, I'm very nothing new on race day. I mean, that, because I'm so, I, I know so little about kind of the nutrition aspect of running. I tend to like, you know, really have them focus on trying things out on their own. Mm -hmm. I know me personally, when I run marathons, I basically just told you what I did. I, you know, I <laughs> will drink water and training runs and then I switch every other, um, every other station between water and Gatorade. Yeah. Um, just to kind of get the salt in there. But I mean, I've never had an issue with it, but you're totally right that some, uh, when it comes to nutrition, um, it, it can, it can vary a lot by the athlete um, and what right. their, what their body's able to kind of get used to. Right. But this information, it's uh, I have more kind of confidence in my ability to uh, communicate, you know, hydration options. So, th so thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Hi, Samantha. Um, I do have a kind of a follow-up question um, kind of relating to the Gatorade. Um, so I know that obviously replenishing your body with the electrolytes after exercise, you know, is important and making sure you're getting the sodium and potassium levels back up. But is there um, a significant benefit to consuming something like Gatorade before a hard effort? Like, especially if it's going to be a really hot or humid day. So like, for example, I personally will if i know i have a hard effort um you know the next day i'll and i know it's going to be super warm and humid i'll just like sip on a 24 ounce bottle of gatorade like all day is there any benefit to i mean to doing that 
I mean, yeah, it, absolutely. You're kind of, it's like all about, it's that buffer, right? Of kind of getting your hydration levels and your electrolyte levels to kind of be in that like safe zone before you start to really repent it or deplete in the heat. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it, it, again, I, I hate that I keep saying it depends on the athlete, but it really does. If, if Gatorade is what works for you, I, I think personally, there are probably some, um, better options where you can kind of incorporate again, that gel water, just allow a little bit more of the absorption into it. Um, right. but if Gatorade works for you and it able to, is able to kind of keep those levels a little bit more normalized throughout your run, then, then there's no harm in it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Yeah. Okay, any other, any other questions? All right, yeah, I think we're right about out of time anyway. Um, <clears throat> Sam, thank you so much. You know, it's really, um, you know, powerful to hear this, you know, from someone with your background and, and relationship to, co to athletes like we all have. So it's really nice to kind of hear this, this from you. Um, you know, we'll, we'll, we're going to try and schedule more um, of these in the future, um, but we, we're definitely lucky to have people like Sam to, to come take time for us to, to, to share this uh, knowledge. So, um, so thank you so much, Sam, and thank you everyone for, for participating. Yeah, thank you everyone, and thank you for having me. Um, any other, um, any more information that, um, you know, you want to provide or next steps? I mean, so um, Finish Line is obviously um, here in New York. Um, but I don't know if you have any contact or information that you'd like to share. Yeah, if, um, it's pretty easy. You can contact me at Samantha at finishlinept.com. If you have any questions regarding the presentation or anything I spoke about today, always feel free to reach me that way. Um, and I'd be happy to chat. Um, and then again, the book is Quench by Dr. Dana Cohen. Um, I highly suggest it. Well, Samantha, what was the book? People mentioned a book early on. I missed that part. I, me I mentioned the book. Or did somebody mention a book early? early yeah, on? it's The Quench. Okay, The Quench, all right. It's called uh, Quench by Dr. Dana Cohen, um, and it talks okay. basically all about this. It's awesome. I had, it's, e it's an easy read, too. Perfect. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, everybody. All right, bye, everyone. Thanks again, Sam. Bye, Andre. Thank you. Okay, yep. All right, bye. bye.